Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Easy Power Thursday webinar series. My name is Jim Chastain. I'm your host for today's session. And uh, we're looking forward very much to the presentation by, by uh, Dr. Bob Hansen from ABB. And before we do that, as is our custom, we'd like to run a couple poll questions that uh, will give us some perspective as far as the audience leaning. So again, thank you very much. And uh, without obligation or liability, we appreciate your helping us out with this poll question. That is the National Electrical Code has a definition of selective coordination that applies to short circuits, overloads, and ground faults. And that is a true or false question. We will be uh, doing a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So during the presentation, feel free to enter questions in the question box of the webinar control system. It looks like we have close to a quorum. Let's leave this up open another 10 seconds. A couple of late arrivals, good. All right, here's how people have responded to this one. Looks like trues have it four to one. Fair enough. And now the next is, how often do you refer to selective coordination uh, tables in the vendor database? This one, very curious to see how folks respond. It's ironic, we, uh, in this information age, we think if we put anything on the internet, everyone has access to it. Consequently, everyone knows it, which is not always the case. So it's part of uh, kind of sorting this out from a marketing point of view. Looks like we have close to a quorum here. So let's see how folks have responded here. Pretty good distribution. Again, thank you for participating and uh, welcome to the presentation. The uh, presenter today comes with a severe experience. I think that will benefit us all. And we're looking forward to his presentation. Uh, Bob, let me hand the uh, presentation over to you and you can share your screen. Mr. Bob Hansen. Okay, thank you. So, Jim, thank you very much. Thanks, thank you to Easy Power for uh, allowing me to uh, uh, share this uh, information with everybody. Um, and thank you, everybody, for attending. My name is Bob Hansen. I am a field application engineer with uh, ABB. And uh, today's topic is really selected uh, by me out of uh, questions that I commonly get uh, and encounter during previous presentations such as this or um, during conversations with a, a variety of folks in the industry. So this is what I've got planned uh, for today. Uh, uh, just wanna make sure we're all talking about the, using the same uh, definition. So off, you know, reading off the same sheet of music, so to say. So just do a quick review of what uh, some of the key things the NEC requires and definitions, and then jump into the, the, these, these various topics uh, in terms of specifying selective coordination, uh, some details on coordinating circuit breakers, and then even further details on how to do that across low voltage general purpose transformers. What, what do you do when a circuit breaker has ground fault? And then talk a little bit about the circuit breaker ratios. Okay, so I'll start with just, uh, again, some of the basics here. Uh, there is, of course, I think you're all aware, a, a formal definition of selective uh, coordination that appears in the code. Uh, that, of course, is in the, the, the section for definitions under uh, uh, Article uh, 100. Um, and, and then there's a, another, not a definition, because obviously it is in Section 100 under Article 517.31, that is a more of a, a, for lack of a better term, a, a definition by usage where it's referring to point one second coordination. So let, let's just touch a little bit on, on each of these. So the formal definition in the code, selective coordination, uh, its intent is, uh, for most part, universally accepted as meaning only the first device upstream of the fault would clear that fault, leaving the remainder of the system unaffected. 
Uh, as the polling question showed, uh, there's still some interpretation differences in this. And, and I feel those come about from the fact that the term overcurrent uh, may not be defined in the NEC. Uh, I feel it is defined in other IEEE uh, literature, and uh, again, for the 80% that voted that uh, the, this definition does apply to overloads, short circuit, and ground fault, uh, I, I think then you're using the same definition I would of overcurrent. Uh, if you're in the 20% uh, that doesn't agree with this, then I guess the conversation continues, but this is the, uh, the assumption I'm working under today with anything I discussed that when we're talking about uh, this definition of select coordinate, select coordination, we're talking about any possible type of fault current out to the maximum available fault current on the system. Now, under Article 517 for healthcare systems, um, this is the most recent statement of that, but pretty much uh, a similar statement since 2014 appeared uh, for, uh, again, uh, Article 517 systems. This uh, states the requirement uh, differently uh, than the, the formal definition of selective coordination up above, in that for, again, essential systems of a healthcare facility, coordination uh, up to um, uh, the point of 0.1 second and beyond is, is what's required. So in other words, this statement is saying that if, if the fault occurs uh, uh, below uh, 0.1 seconds and were to be cleared below that, we're not worried about coordination. Uh, the industry has adopted a term for the formal definition, the Article 100 definition, in calling that 0 0.01 uh, second, so 0 0.01 second coordination, the kind of visually when you're reading it, uh, perhaps distinguish it quickly from 0.1 second requirements. Uh, realize that 0 0.01 second coordination is again, I, I feel it has been an industry adopted terms, it's used widely in specifications, but it's technically not correct. It almost sounds like it's to the exclusion of coordination between zero and 0 0.1 seconds, and that's, that's not the intent. It's just, again, an industry adopted term to indicate the application of this definition. So I'm going to use 0 0.01 second coordination and the term selective coordination interchangeably to mean coordination throughout the uh, complete range of available fault current for any type of fault. And examples of systems requiring uh, selective uh, coordination, more specifically, right, Article 700, 701, legally required standby, 708, critical operations power systems, and those associated articles for those sections. We mentioned 517 for essential systems and uh, hospitals. Another example, elevators and other associated Article 620 equipment. And of course, there, there are more areas of the code that make statements about uh, selective coordination requirements. But these, these would be some of the, the most common ones that you see in, in many uh, designs and facilities. Okay, so with that kind of quick background, let me jump uh, in, into the various uh, common questions and in some cases, maybe misconceptions. Uh, selective coordination of circuit breakers. Um, I think most folks who are in design and, and doing uh, typical commercial systems, institutional systems, uh, know circuit breakers and have, can coordinate. But if you haven't done that type of work, you, you may still look at time current curves and see breakers that are overlapping and wondering, well, how can those possibly coordinate if they're overlapping? So let, let's address the, the question. Can circuit breakers coordinate even though they overlap in the instantaneous region? And if so, how do I determine if a circuit breaker pair coordinates? Well, the, the, the upfront answer to that is yes, the circuit breakers can coordinate, but let, let's work our way slowly to, to that point. So it, it helps, uh, the way I like to discuss it is, is just recognize kind of there are two major parts to a time current curve when we're talking coordination. So I've got two electronic trip circuit breakers laid side by side in the plot you see on the right, and the various numbers are the different breakpoints between a pickup and a, uh, a delay. And if we were to look at, say, this first shaded area, kind of from point four, where I transitioned from short time to instantaneous, if I look at that and um, uh, from that point above, um, I, I would say, well, if I can just separate the breakers, then from point four and above, I can say they're separated. 
they're, they're coordinated because I have that separated with someone called white space from the old age of using onion skin plugs. So I call this kind of the non-instantaneous region or, or what some NEMA documents might call the overload region. Uh, so that's a, that's a separate uh, technique, a separate skill to determine coordination in, in this zone. Now, once I go down below 0.4 and I deal with the instantaneous part of the protection and especially that pesky uh, foot of the breaker that uh, tends to overlap in most cases with some exceptions, um, it's really a different skill set to know how to get these breakers coordinate to coordinate. And what it comes down to is really uh, needing a, a vendor coordination table in, in order to discern if I can get um, coordination in this area. In some cases, as I'll mention later, there are some coordination tables out there that will also guide you on the non-instantaneous part. But uh, bottom line to understand here is when we say selective coordination, again, per the code definition, uh, or again, the informal industry term of 0.01 second coordination, we're talking about both colored regions have to coordinate to uh, out to whatever the maximum available fault current is. So how do I know in that, uh, that lower instantaneous region, how do I know if a circuit breaker is gonna coordinate? Well, again, circuit breaker coordination tables uh, will guide you in that area. So it is a, a document that each major vendor produces uh, that will uh, allow you to identify specific breaker pairs and to what level of fault current they uh, would, would coordinate. Now, different vendors will have different styles of tables. Uh, some tables will be for instantaneous coordination only. Uh, that is, the, the table values tell you the, the instantaneous coordination and then everything else is determined by uh, time current curve analysis. And then some tables are designed to give you information on both the, the instantaneous and non-instantaneous parts of, of the breaker uh, curves. Uh, now, the typical means of obtaining selectivity in the instantaneous region, and this is not meant to be all-inclusive if there are other newer technologies I'm not aware of, but I think this would cover the, the large percentage of, of ways that breakers get coordinated. Uh, one way uh, that you know, the tables would cover are simply the design of the breaker and, and the physics of the, the, the breakers in those systems. Uh, no special algorithms in the breakers or wiring between those breakers. Uh, another way where an electronic trip unit is involved, say as the upstream and, and any breaker down type of breaker downstream is, there could be an algorithm in that upstream, upstream electronic trip breaker that facilitates coordination with, with downstream uh, breakers but no wiring between them. And then kind of at the, the, the another level, there can be uh, say electronic trip to electronic trip. You can have algorithms in the trip units that may also require wiring between the breakers. And an example, a typical example of that is something like instantaneous uh, zone selective interlocking. Now again, every vendor's table will be a little different, uh, but one thing all the tables I'm familiar with uh, share in common is that they're basically organized the same way in that the downstream breakers form the rows, the upstream breakers form the columns, and where those rows and columns intersect, there's a number, and then that's the number to which the breaker pair coordinates. Now, it's very important uh, when you're looking at these tables, and I'm gonna show you one here in an example to make this a little more concrete. Uh, there's a number, like I said, many numbers in the tables, but you also have to read any uh, introductory material to those tables or the notes for that tables, because it is very common to have uh, assumptions or specific requirements that go to the, the table. And I go, I'll give you an example of one here in a second. Now, here's an example of a specific table. This is, is one we produce in my company. Uh, this table shows instantaneous selectivity only. And let me just give you just an example by walking through this one of how you read one of these tables. So on the left-hand side are choices for downstream breakers. Right, this is one table of several, so this covers certain downstream choices. Another table might cover different downstream choices. Okay, so there are the downstream breakers. Now we go to the top. Uh, this is listing what I've highlighted now in the top, a, a specific breaker type, the frame type, and then listing the family of trip units that you could use with that breaker that are valid for this selective coordination. Now, one row underneath the upstream breaker family listings 
are the sensor options. So now, again, if you're not already familiar with these tables, I'm trying to make you sensitive to the, to the fact that the selection of these breakers is very specific to the things we've already discussed, but also even the sensor uh, size that is with that breaker, because in some cases, a breaker can have various sensor sizes. So as a quick example, let's say we have this breaker called the T-Max XT4 as a downstream breaker, and we want to know to what coordination level can we coordinate with, say, an upstream 600 amp sensor T-Max XT5. Well, where the row and the column intersect, there's a number. That number says 100,000 amps. So as uh, long as you've selected breakers that actually have AIC ratings of 100,000 amps, then that's the, the maximum uh, coordination you could get between those two breakers in the instantaneous uh, uh, region. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there are typically some notes or assumptions or requirements using the table that would be listed in the, uh, the vendor's document. So do be very careful to read those. And as an example, for uh, the upfront matter uh, paragraph that's ahead of this table, it explains that if the trip unit has a adjustability, the trip unit instantaneous pickup must be set at maximum in order for these, value to, these values to, to be usable, to, to, to be valid. Okay, so circuit breakers uh, can coordinate, and especially for the instantaneous region, using the vendor coordination tables is a, a vital skill. Let's talk a little bit about specification of selective coordination, because every, every firm or, or group that might specify a project does it a little differently, and, and there are many ways to, to do it uh, that will work just fine. But the typical question is, do I need to include specifications for selective coordination? Or possibly, should I just leave it to the bidding vendor to decide what to do because they know how to meet the code using their vendor-specific products? The, the theory being that the vendor knows their breakers the best, so I shouldn't go overboard on, on specifying it. Well, the bottom line, my bottom line answer to this is you want to do as complete a job as possible to specify the, the selective coordination. And yeah, there's some basic uh, rules you're going to need to follow to design when you want selective coordination. Uh, but uh, use your plans and specs just like you would for any other aspect of the project. Uh, give clear, complete, concise specifications. Well, how do I do that? Well, let me kind of give you a look behind the curtain here from a vendor perspective of, of what we typically have to do uh, to put it, things in perspective for you. Remember, as I say, an engineer designer, you may have been working on a project for several months, if not several or a couple of years, and had, have very frequent contacts. So you're intimately familiar with that project. You know it in and out. But remember, when you hand it off to go out to bid, uh, it probably goes through several hands, and by the time the, the vendor gets it, they have uh, relatively little time to make quick decisions on who all has to be on the team to propose this, what factories do I need to send this to to make quotes, and, and what are the fundamental requirements, and one of the most important ones being, what are the selective coordination requirements? Because that, that takes a, a special skill set to specifically select those breakers. So as an example, you know, we're quickly looking for what version of the NEC is in, in effect. We certainly like the, the plans to, to indicate that uh, and not leave it to individual vendors to, um, to determine that on their own. Similar for local jurisdiction amendment, amendments, right? If, if you're aware of something that the local ASJ has an amendment on that modifies something in the area selective coordination, it, it's, it's really good to put that in your specifications. Uh, then, of course, a typical vendor is going to look through the specifications to say to see what it says regarding selective coordination. Uh, what notes are on the drawings about selective coordination? Are the notes on the drawings and what's written in the spec, uh, do they complement each other and are they consistent? If not, uh, calls to, to the engineer may happen. And overall, is it clear which circuits or parts of the one line require selective coordination? Now, again, when you have been working on the project for many months or like a year or more, you know, all of that will seem very, very obvious to you. But again, keep in mind the, the, the plans and drawings have to be interpreted by another human being who's going to look at this for the, for the first time. So if I were to sum it up from the perspective of the uh, specifier, I, I'd sum it up this way, the three W's, the what, the where, and the why. Before you send your project out, look at it closely and see if you can quickly answer these three questions 
without relying on your uh, in-depth knowledge of having worked on the project. Or perhaps you give it to a, a peer in the office who hasn't worked on the project to see if they can quickly make these assessments. So what? What level of coordination is required? What definition are we using? Is it 0.1 second? Is it all possible fault currents? The, again, the, the formal definition in the section 100 of the code, what we informally call 0.01 second coordination. Could it possibly be both or neither? That should be very clear and quickly discernible. Where is the selective coordination required? Well, a lot of you will probably say, well, isn't that obvious from you know just knowing electrical systems? In many cases, it is. So for example, if you're using labels like ATSLS, LS is interpreted as like safety, ATSLRS, legally required standby, that certainly makes it easy to pick out which systems the coordination requires. But I have seen drawings that use ATSA, B, C, D, etc. And then what's the vendor to do? Well, you could go to the panel schedules uh, and discern the type of loads to figure out what's what, or you could call the engineer. So in my opinion, it's simply better to use uh, you know N for normal, E for emergency, ATS LS, ATS LRS. That will more readily identify which parts of the systems require the, the selective uh, coordination. So that and knowledge of the code should produce uh, an accurate um, uh, bill of material. Now this last one also may strike some of you as odd, but why is selective coordination required? I, I put that one there because it is not too uncommon that you'll see requirements and specifications that exceed what the NEC would dictate or perhaps in some cases are less than what the NEC would dictate. So when one sees that and there's not a clarification to the why, it generates questions. Well, was something missed, something not understood, or is the engineer and owner simply asking for more coordination than the NEC requires, which is certainly allowed. Uh, if you're asking for less than what the NEC allows, then there should be an AHJ e exemption. Uh, so it, it becomes a, a bit of an issue. So put the why if you're doing something, especially if you're doing something that isn't standard to code. Which design documents should include selective coordination requirements for the, the project? So again, uh, we're, we're talking about drawings and um, uh, specifications. And I'd like to start the discussion with uh, bringing up the power system study spec, right? It's a standard spec that's uh, uh, thrown into uh, 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 projects. Realize that the power system study spec is a service spec, right? It's, it's a study is going to be done and a report is produced and delivered. Whereas coordination requirements are really an equipment performance spec. So now certainly it makes more sense to put the coordination requirements in one location as opposed to saying uh, all the coordination requirements and put that in your switchboard, your switch gear, your panel board spec, right? So it is an industry norm and everybody knows to look in the power system study spec to look for um, selective coordination requirements. It can also be in the, court, in, in the equipment specs, that's okay. Uh, but uh, you know, wherever it's put, you know, we want it to meet the tenants and, and, and as I discussed earlier and, and obviously be clear. Now, one of the things I just wanna make sure that no one gets lulled into, just because it's in the power system study spec, right? Uh, the, the power system study engineer is not gonna be able to make everything coordinate if uh, right, the design for one doesn't lend itself to the level of coordination required and uh, the right bill of material breakers aren't part of, of what the engineer is, is using to study. So kind of bottom line here, and, and this alludes to the points I was making earlier, when we have 0.1 second coordination, it's really achieved as, as all these study engineers know by adjusting any available settings on the breakers you've been given to work with. If I'm gonna coordinate to the entire range of available fault current, uh, I really need to make it clear that uh, I'm doing that. So you know, again, some specs will use the term 0 0.01 second coordination. And then the study engineer ultimately can't prove, can only prove the circuit breaker coordination by adjusting device settings and using vendor coordination tables. Again, if you want to, to show coordination for the entire range of available fault current. Now, there are a couple of st standard statements in the uh, system study that I want to bring to your attention that if left unedited may cause confusion in some situations. And these are the two uh, statements that are in quotes here. 
that I find are in what I would call the canned, uh, canned meaning provided by some national service that provides standard specifications. And, and the issue that I'm bringing up is look at the, uh, the terms uh, where it refers to provide adequate time margins. Uh, and then in the other statement, it quotes, graphically illustrate adequate time separation exists. As I tried to point out earlier, when we're talking about separation of the curves, that's easy to do from, uh, you know, once you're above the instantaneous region. And though that's the skill and technique, really, that's used to promote 0.1 second coordination. But time separation, you can't do that with uh, typically with an instantaneous part of the protection curve. So the bottom line point in this discussion is if you're not adding something else to this spec or other parts of the spec to clarify you're not looking, you know, if you want, say, selective coordination per the Article 100 definition, if that's what you really want, you do need to add things to the statement because if I read only these statements and nothing else, it's really telling me 0.1 coordination. Well, what would such a uh, statement or addition to that spec look like? Well, here's what I think is a, a pretty good example. Uh, actually, that, that was, has been used in uh, specification. So it identifies, and I'm talk, we're talking about emergency, legally required standby, and healthcare essential power systems. And then it goes on to identify the specific name of the type of system along with the article reference and then with a reference to the time in seconds. So all of that is great. And then it even breaks out by the particular branch of an essential system of a healthcare uh, facility, what the, the time standard is for uh, coordination. So this makes it uh, very clear. This is a good spec. Uh, the only improvement I would say, suggest to it is it, instead of putting uh, you know, put in there also the, the addition of the National Electric Code. And if you, you know, have already figured out their amendments uh, for the particular project, add that in there also. But the, the core of it is, is very, very good and very, very uh, helpful to interpret exactly what the requirements are. And here are example of uh, drawing notes uh, that, that I found very helpful, just examples. So selectively coordinate the emergency branch per 2020 NEC article 700.32. That tells me everything I need to know to, to select the correct breakers. The example, example below that it says kind of the same thing. It doesn't do the code reference, but it spells out in, in good detail, hey, I want you know, uh, uh, devices feeding and, and uh, ATSLS and ATSLRS and what's below it, and I'm going to coordinate to 0 0.01 seconds. And then it uh, has a note number that's applied to all the breakers that are expected to be coordinated to the standard. So again, that's very helpful by applying the note number to the specific breakers. And then here's another example on the bottom. Manufacturer shall select appropriate breaker types to provide selective coordination for all supply side upstream devices connected to systems containing normal and generator power circuits. Uh, then I really like this statement, coordination shall be demonstrated by manufacturers published coordination tables. So when they say coordination tables, ah, okay, I, I, I know exactly what this engineer is thinking. And then it goes on to make the code references. And then this uh, requirements and assumptions bullet two is a very nice one. Uh, you know, it says to assume unlimited short circuit current on the primary. Uh, that's uh, taking the mint on the primary of say your service entrance uh, transformer. And what that uh, assumption included in the, in the spec or note does, it puts everybody on an equal footing that uh, if we assume unlimited primary, we can do an easy calculation to figure out what then the secondary available fault current was, would be, and then proceed from there to, to pick the appropriate uh, breakers, as opposed to each vendor making their own assumption as to what the available short circuit current might be, which then um, would allow different uh, selection of, of, of breakers. So these are all good, good examples to follow. Okay, so that was a little bit about uh, my thoughts and specifications, um, a little bit about coordination across uh, a transform. Again, this is a common question I get, and it generally uh, it kind of evolve, uh, revolves somewhere around this type of question or discussion. I, I've heard that coordination at a general purpose transformer uh, and let's say we're talking about your basic, you know, again, low voltage primary, low voltage secondary, but this could be, for example, a 480 to 208 and 120 transformer, 
using many designs. So for such a transformer, I've heard that the coordination starts over. So I only need to coordinate the 208 volt side and the 480 volt side separately and not worry about the 208 volt to 480 volt coordination across the transformer. Is this true? Well, my answer to this particular question is it's not true, but the element of truth into this is that because of the characteristics of the transformer, it does in fact make it easier to coordinate. And when you look at the time current curve, it kind of guides you toward the thinking that, oh, the, the coordination across the transformer takes care of itself. Well, it may work out that way, even without explicit effort from the, the folks involved in designing it or studying it, but it does take a consistent uh, application of the coordination principles, some of which we've talked about, and potentially coordination tables in order to get it right every time. So let's talk through that a little bit. All right, uh, so here's an example of uh, a very simple uh, uh, one line. And let's say there's a, our, our general purpose transformer. And, and if, if coordination is required, let's say in this example, uh, out to the definition, uh, out to the full available fault current as listed in the Article 100 definition, then you know branches C and D would need to coordinate with B. Branches C and D would need to coordinate with A, the primary uh, feeder breaker to the uh, to the transformer. But A and B don't necessarily need to coordinate with each other because whether I lose one or both, it's going to have the same effect on the system. So uh, wh what's the role of the transformer in this? Well, the, the key aspects are obviously we have the transformation ratio where we're, we're dropping voltage but you know, increasing the amperage ratio. And when I have a fault on a 208 volt side, then I still see less fault on the 480 volt side and the fault current is limited because of the impedance of the transformer. So you know, impedance is typically between 3.5 to maybe 5.5 or 6% on these types of transformers. That has a very specific effect. So just as a quick, little, quick example, say this were a 45 kVA transformer, say 2900 uh, uh, amps of available fault current, just considering the let through current, I'm not gonna consider any uh, motors uh, in, in this basic discussion. Uh, so 2900 at the 208 side, uh, that's gonna be 1255 on 480 volt. So obviously the 480 volt side is gonna see a substantially reduced amperage relative to 28 volt side. And the upshot is here, lower fault currents lend themselves to simpler coordination uh, solutions. So let's uh, tie this together by looking at a typical uh, layout for coordination across uh, a low voltage transformer. So here I'm going to look at uh, the uh, a panel board that uh, shows, uh, uh, in this case I've extended the one line up a little bit. I've got uh, branch br breakers D that need to coordinate with the main in that 208 side. So uh, D needs to coordinate with C. Uh, D needs to coordinate uh, with uh, B and A. And B and C don't necessarily need to coordinate with each other. So that, that's the objective we're trying to reach. So let's walk through this uh, time current curve layout and look at the essential points. So again, I'm not showing numbers or settings. Uh, the focus is on the, the concept here. Similarly, I'm not showing the damage curves of the transformer. Obviously, obviously, the transformer has to be protected. I just want to show the, con the key concepts here for coordinating across the transformer. So there's my electronic trip main. Um, uh, again, for uh, uh, this example is really for selective coordination across uh, a transformer for the full 0 0.01 second level. And typically an electronic trip would be required there. In this case, I'm also using an electronic trip as the primary feeder B. Now on the 208 volt side, again, I'm using an electronic trip breaker. Uh, and then on the branch side, there's my thermal magnetic. All right, now this, the first key point is obviously the 480 volt side devices, they've got to be upstream of the inrush point. So I've done that. You got to make sure that happens, that your upstream breakers are to the right and above the inrush point. Next salient point here is the 208 volt breakers. Uh, they have their, um, the instantaneous foot of their breaker truncated. And that's the effect of the impedance of that transformer. 
So that's a plus in helping us coordinate it. I also, I, I often call this a stubby foot compared to the elongated foot you get when say you don't have as much impedance uh, from the source. Uh, the next salient point is here, I've got my upstream devices set above where the downstream breaker has its truncated uh, point due to the transformer impedance. Now, you don't have to do that. Uh, you could have it overlapping, but then you're definitely going to be looking at the coordination tables as to does breaker uh, B in this case actually coordinate you know, for these downstream breakers and, and do I have the settings right for that? So in this case, you see how I have a white space now between the 480 volt side and the 280 volt side. So there's no issue with coordination between those breakers in this case. I have no overlap. And that's where the perception is, well, I just do the 208 volt side separately from the 480 volt side and I don't worry what it comes across. Like I said, that it commonly can work out to be that way but it may not work out that way in every case. You do have to be uh, look at this specifically to make sure it works out. So now I've gotten to this point and really the only decisions left are, well, how do I know these areas of overlap coordinate? And that's where the uh, vendor coordination table would ensure you have to correct the breaker pairs and, and also guide you as to any special settings requirements to make sure this overlap is in fact coordinated. Okay, so lastly, I would like uh, to, oh, actually not lastly, second to last, uh, talk a little bit about ground fault. Again, another common question. So how do I evaluate selective coordination when one of the breakers, and typically say the upstream, but it could be two levels of coordination, has ground fault protection? So to this point, we've really kind of focused on upstream phase to downstream phase, but obviously there are other combinations that could involve ground fault as shown as uh, kind of situations two and three but they're gonna be evaluated similarly. The major difference is gonna be, you now have to consider the combined curve of the ground fault curve along with the phase curve in evaluating coordination with the downstream breaker. Uh, overlap in the instantaneous regions of the phase protection, you're still gonna coordinate that just as we've already discussed. So here's a simple example. Again, I'm leaving out numbers and settings to just focus on the concept. This happens to be a 1600 amp uh, main with say a 250 amp feeder sitting on the, the same bus. There's no overlap in the non-instantaneous region, so I know I have at least 0.1 coordination. And when I check the coordination tables for this specific breaker pair, I can determine that um, they coordinate in the instantaneous region. So these two breakers are coordinated. Now that was phase only. Let's add ground fault protection to the upstream breaker. And what happens when I do that? Well, I've selected a very low uh, ground fault pickup and now I've caused some overlap between the upstream ground fault protection and the downstream breaker. Uh, remember, that even though the downstream breaker doesn't have its own ground fault protection capability, uh, it will see extra fault current as a result of the ground fault and will respond even with its phase set protection eventually to whatever that ground fault current may be uh, that's added into uh, uh, the, the, the current that would normally be, uh, be seen. So it's, it's gonna be a fault current it sees, it's just not gonna be able to react as quickly as the, uh, the, uh, the upstream ground fault protection. So in this shaded area I'm showing now, clearly there's a, a range of amperage where if I have a fault, the ground fault curve is gonna commit to tripping and trip before the upstream breaker even commits to tripping. So that area is not selectively coordinated. And again, when I talked about the combined um, uh, phase and ground fault curve, this is kind of the left edge of that that I'm talking about. So you see, I've had that intersection of the dash line with some part of the phase protection downstream. That's what I need, would like to avoid. And uh, again, the overlap in the instantaneous rate region, I'm still gonna do that the same way with my coordination tables. Now in the next colored zone, uh, there, I don't have a coordination issue because I don't have overlap between the upstream and downstream, and any overlap in the instantaneous region, again, will be handled by coordination tables. So we can adjust the ground fault pickup as shown in this next slide, and uh, the ground fault curve is now um, uh, put at a pickup setting that allows it to have white space everywhere with the downstream phase protection. So these breakers are now coordinated. 
some of you may make the point, well, that's awfully close together between the ground fold pickup and the downstream phase, and you're correct. Uh, a lot of folks, uh, because of the various uh, uh, assumptions that still go into a study, like uh, cable impedance uh, or uh, cable distances, et cetera, which may not be exactly known. Some would like to go over space. So just make sure you're checking the, your model to, to see that uh, there may be some other um, uh, uh, sloping or um, shaping capability. And here's an example of you know, something uh, that can be done with uh, some ground fault uh, settings to put an additional uh, uh, delay or, or pickup and to make the shape look more like an electronic uh, trip unit to make it easier to coordinate and get maybe in this case, get a little more space right in there between the um, uh, ground fault curve and the uh, pickups of the uh, phase protection. So this would be an example of a, a well-coordinated uh, uh, main with ground fault with a downstream feeder without the ground fault. Okay, so lastly, I am gonna talk about um, coordination and the concept of, of ratios. Uh, before I do that, I do want to point out to Jim and the audience, uh, I, I have a notice coming up on the computer that Office is going to restart in 10 minutes, not giving me an option to delay. Um, the IT gods are upon me. Um, I'm not sure that's going to affect uh, what we're doing, but if it is, uh, I think I'll be done with this section in, in, in 10 minutes, but it may in fact affect uh, the, the question and answer period, in which case if it does, I will try to resume as quickly as possible. Okay, so instead uh, of, uh, here's the common question, instead of using vendor coordination tables, why can't I just use a rule of thumb for ratios of circuit breakers that will selectively coordinate? Well, let's talk about that. Uh, First of all, anything I say here is, is not meant to, if, if such tables exist, uh, my comments here are not meant to dissuade you. Um, I, I'm not aware in the NEMA market that, uh, that such official documents exist. I, I did find one for the IEC market that uh, referenced the uh, ratios. Uh, so please accept these comments as you know, my perspective on at least why ABB uh, hasn't done this yet. So ratios are going to vary by specific breaker families that are involved. Uh, thermal mag to thermal mag cases are going to have a much higher ratio because of the wider tolerances in those type of breakers. E-trip to thermal mag uh, will get a little better and then E-trip to E-trip may be your lowest ratios because of the uh, tighter tolerances. Ratios for 0.1 second coordination are going to be different than what is needed to get 0.1 coordination. Instantaneous coordination in particular is a function for some breakers, especially the, the smaller one, branch-like breakers, is going to be a function of the number of poles for some breakers. Okay, so these are just some of the, the reasons why there'll be very specific cases of ratios that are unique to very specific circumstances. So again, in my opinion, in general, there'll be too many ratios to know or reference. Uh, and overall, using such an approach is not gonna be easier and it's gonna be less reliable than using time current curve analysis and coordination tables. And here's a, a, you know, another major, major theme here. What ratios am I even talking about? I really didn't define what ratio I'm talking about. And I find that's a common theme when, when this conversation comes up in, in any forum folks tend to focus on, you know, frame separation, but really, you know, there are two things that should be considered when we're talking about breakers, because remember, in many cases, I can have two and sometimes three different breaker frames per provide the same amperage setting. So you really have a lot of flexibility there, but for breakers, you really need to look at both the, the frame separation and the amperage separation. So I, I like to use the term frame separation. I think amperage ratios is okay too, but I think amperage or using ratios for the, for, for the frames becomes a, a little difficult or misleading. So let's take those one at a time. You wanna talk about frames. Again, every vendor is gonna have different rules. Uh, I, I think in regard to frames, we're probably all, all close, but again, talk to the, the specific vendor. For the ABB specific case uh, out of our DET 760, just as an example, if the, the fault current below the branch breaker is low enough, you're going to get four levels of molded case circuit breaker uh, and, and kind of as shown here, kind of your 100 amp frame level, 
that covers down to your down as low as your 20 amp or 15 amp uh, uh, branch breakers, a 200 amp, 250 amp frame level, so on and so forth. Again, the groupings I'm using, kind of lumping them into the same kind of frame size. That may be different from vendor to vendor, but this is typically how, how we look at it in, in my company. Otherwise, if the, the fault current isn't sufficiently uh, low enough down at the, the, the branch breaker, the thing feeding the load, then you may be looking at three layers of breakers. Now, based on, again, what I'm showing you here that is specific from our tables, uh, there, there's a very simple rule that pops out that you need at least one frame size of separation, at least one frame size of separation. So that, that's kind of a, a quick discussion on, on the frame separation. Now, if I want to look at amperages, uh, let's look at the case again, say, where we could get our four levels of molded case circuit breaker. When I look at the possible amperages involved, again, remember this 250 amp frame may have a, a selection down to maybe say 100 amps or so. Uh, where thermomagnetics are involved at some point, right, you're gonna have a thermomagnetic feeding your, your 20 amp or 15, 30 amp loads. Uh, that would be typical. The amperage ratios there are typically going to be higher. In a specific case, I, I know from our own, uh, uh, this 250 amp frame breaker, if it's an electronic trip with many common branch breakers that would use it, be used at uh, say 208, 240 or 480, you can get down to 1.6, 1 1.7 uh, ratio uh, of, of the amperage setting and everything will, will work. Uh, but there are other specific breakers that might need, you know, that are used from time to time for specific reasons, maybe maybe a subfeed to thermomagnetic, it, it might need a 2.5 ratio. So again, even within one vendor using different breaker types for different reasons, they're gonna be different ratios. Once you get higher up and you start using electronic trips, if this were electronic trip to electronic trip between these two frame sizes, here we have uh, the, the ability, especially with newer trip units with lower tolerances, you can get sub 1.2 to one ratio in terms of your amperage settings. If it's an older trip unit or one with less tolerance, you can get down to 1.3 to, to, to one ratio still. And then again, uh, the higher up you go, probably more likely you're gonna use E-trip to E-trip, same thing. You can get fairly low ratios of amperage settings. And here's an example on the left-hand side of, um, uh, of a way to, to space these out, to kind of um, you know, crunch them down to lower amperages. It's often the life safety systems for smaller facilities that provide the, the bigger challenge. And you have to look at very carefully, the, the larger systems typically aren't as much as a problem as long as you observe the, the three level or depending on the fault current available, the four level of molded case circuit breaker uh, rules. Okay, so uh, I wanna do a, a quick summary. Again, uh, I see that I'm gonna have a forced office update in three minutes. So I hope that doesn't affect uh, anything uh, in our connection here and we'll proceed with the question and answer. But to summarize quickly, please think of the WWW I talked about, the what, when, uh, what, where, and why of selective coordination to make sure that's uh, as clear as possible when you're producing uh, your design plans and, and bid documents. Uh, as hopefully I've, I've convinced you uh, or you already knew, coordination uh, of circuit breakers is possible even when the time current curves overlap, even if it's in the instantaneous region, um, and co consult uh, the, the need to consult uh, vendor coordination tables. Uh, coordination across a transformer, you're going to follow all the same principles we talked about, but you do get a bit of a, a helping hand from the nature of the, the transformer properties. Where ground fault protection is involved, uh, again, make sure you're looking at that combined phase and ground fault curve when evaluating selectivity with a downstream device. Uh, using frame separation requirements indicated in the vendor coordination tables uh, for coordination in the instantaneous region is a must to be able to consistently uh, produce designs that can be coordinated by vendor offerings. And then uh, in the area of amperage separation, remember you can provide uh, uh, amperage settings on multiple frames. Um, the amperage settings, it will be documented in, in some tables, not all, uh, but can also be easily determined, especially for the E-trip to E-trip by just knowing that the long time pickup tolerances involved. So at that point, uh, I, I will stop here. I thank you very much for joining and uh, for your attention. And uh, let's see what questions we can answer.
Good job, Bob. I'm going to show you the question box right now. You should be able to find it now on your control panel. Let me let me know, Jim, when I can. Uh, should be able to open it now. See. Okay, so I have the questions section open, uh, and I'm not seeing anything at this point. Let me read them to you. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. The first first question is, uh, will you be able to share the slides? If you could send me a PDF copy of your presentation, we can link it with the video when it's posted. The next question is, is the ground fault a kind of short circuit as well? What what I tried to uh, uh, explain was uh, the, the ground fault curve. Uh, you need to evaluate that simultaneously, simultaneously with your phase protection to make sure that combined over, uh, envelope does not intersect with the downstream device. The one exception there being, if your uh, if you have instantaneous overlap between the the phase of upstream and downstream, you can resolve that using a vendor coordination table. I think that question came in early on, so you probably covered it. In addition, okay. uh, Chuck's wanting to know: Does Easy Power allow to show the ground fault trip portion of the curve? Look like you use oh. Easy Power for your plots. I was going to leave that question to you. If you want me to comment, could you could you repeat the question? Does Easy Power allow to show the ground fault trip portion of the curve? Well, I, yeah, I, absolutely, and that, that is in fact what I used in one of my uh, demo slides. Uh, yes, uh, no, no, no problem uh, for me showing that uh, on Easy Power. Then uh, Jack wants to know what's the reason for some breakers as far as the foot does not stop vertically and it goes down to 0.01 axis. Okay, so if, if you're looking at, say, a, uh, a circuit breaker and you are looking specifically at the instantaneous part of the foot, your observation is correct. And in some cases, even the bottom part of the instantaneous doesn't touch the 0 0.01, if I interpret your question correctly. Mm -hmm. and, and that's due to specific algorithms in that particular circuit breaker. If I didn't, if I didn't interpret the question correctly, please, uh, please ask again or repeat. Uh, then Luis wants to ask to use the coordination tables for confirming coordination on the 0.01 instantaneous region. Do we need to have minimum added impedance to the cable between these two coordinated uh, cables? It says he understands that the tables are results of tests with added impedance with the coordinated circuit breakers the the any, any issues with impedance between the two breakers um, will show up in your plots as uh, different um, uh, cutoff points for or clipping points for where your instantaneous ends right so uh, that would be in one impact of the different cable lengths uh, there is no specific requirement to account for impedance based on what's in, in the tables. Now, if, if the X over R's ratios are different than what uh, the standard X over R ratio, which I don't remember off the top of my head, that's, that's used for uh, UL uh, testing of breakers, then uh, I can't speak for every coordination table, at least in ours, there's a description in our document to explain uh, how to account for that difference and essentially apply an adjustment factor to the, the to the coordination level. Okay, so here's another easy bar question. Chuck follows up previously. Does the ground fault trip curve automatically show uh, on easy power? And I will answer that. That's uh, basically you need to set up a single ground, a single line to ground fault, and then you need to select to show either the phase coordination or ground phase coordination to show the ground curve. So there's two settings you need to deal with, Chuck. And then Jack says, is easy power default to asymmetrical current? Most CB tables use symmetrical current. Uh, so the answer is uh, you get asymmetrical current in the TCC plots and symmetrical current on the one line diagrams and you can change either or both as a as an option. 
and, and it is correct that the tables are based on symmetrical current. I think that's the end of our question. I apologize, uh, Bob. I think you only caught the tail end of the questions because you weren't an early organizer. Oh, no problem. No problem at all. So, yeah, if you could make a copy of this, a PDF copy, I think the audience would be able to appreciate uh, seeing that as they view the video. Uh, I'd be happy to send that to you. Very good job and uh, very informative. Thank you very much, Bob. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity, Jim, and thank you, everybody, for joining. Have a good day.